You may be seen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, please, for the way you led us and changing it up. If you turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 1. As you do so, I once again want to welcome all of our visitors. It's good to have you here with us this morning. A few announcements to keep in mind. Um, we now have a youth teen Sunday school class that began today. And amen. so, amen. Praise the Lord for that. Sister Kendall wrote me last night and said, I'm moved by the Lord to do this now based on some of the things that went on with our uh, sort of retreat this weekend. And so that has started and it will be going on in my office um, beginning at nine o'clock each Sunday. So um, welcome for our teens for that. And uh, we'll certainly be asking our elders and some of our brothers to participate in teaching that. If you want more information, make sure you see Sister Kendall Bedore, who is part of the Bedorable crew. A few more announcements uh, to make. Uh, this coming Saturday, we will have our workshop on trauma, grief, and loss. Sister Michelle Neverdine will be here and presenting that will begin at nine o'clock and go to 1.30. It is um, a free workshop and there's a lot of information. She sent me uh, the handouts and I think there are about 15 of them. So it's gonna be a pretty thorough um, treatment of the subject. So everyone is invited. Uh, you most certainly can invite your friends from other churches or your neighbors or even coworkers, anyone to whom this might uh, pertain. So please keep that in mind, but you must go to our website soaringoaks.org and register. Uh, two more announcements to, uh, to keep in mind. We've been invited by Pastor Brad Carpenter of Grace Sacramento, and he's invited us, um, our men actually, for one of their men's breakfasts. And the topic is Pante Ta Ethne. That's all the ethnic groups, by the way, from, from the Greek. Anyway, it's a biblical exploration of race, ethnicity, and the gospel. Um, we'll be getting more information in terms of the time of that breakfast and the exact location, but it will be at Grace Sacramento. Also, uh, the PCA, our denomination, is having um, a regional women's conference. It will be held at Valley Springs Church, and that will be October 5th and 6th. So please keep those in mind. All right, if you would, again, turn to the Word of God, we're going to read uh, the first seven verses as we come to our conclusion of this particular sermon series and we resume uh, Ephesians, uh, not next week, because we're going to do two parts in this. We're going to end off in part A on this and then do a part B next week and pick it up. But um, as we conclude the series with the fear of the Lord, if you would turn to Proverbs chapter one, I want to once again read the first seven verses. This is uh, the word of God. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That ends the word of God. Pray with me, please. Lord God, how thankful we are for the wondrous cross that shows the power of God and the wisdom of God that has rescued us from the foolish way of life that all of us had in our hearts, in our minds, and in our actions. We thank you for the word of God that presents the wisdom of the living God. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who feared the Lord to the very end of his life and gave himself up as sacrifice for sins for us so that we might know these ways of the Lord in the newness of life. We pray that as we go into your word as an act of worship, that you would impact it upon our heart that in so doing, we would leave here willing, eager, and wanting to walk in your ways 
and to worship the one who is the fountain of wisdom. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. This morning's subject is, in fact, the fear of the Lord, which really is the key and linchpin of everything that Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord, dear ones, is probably one of the most ancient biblical concepts known to humanity. It's a term used in Proverbs 1, throughout the book of Proverbs, and in fact, much of Scripture. And when it relates to God, it carries a meaning of a deep reverence of his word, of his being, of his worship, of his ways, and of his salvation. As used throughout Scripture, it's further fleshed out as someone who stands in awe of a person or being who is in an exalted position. When it's used in this way, the word connotes not simply or just a simple fear, but a deep reverence, whereby an individual recognizes the power and position of the being that is being revered and then renders him the proper respect. It's the kind of word that can be lost in our modern day because of democratic government. Not that there's anything wrong with democratic government, I much prefer it than other kinds of governments, but I'm just saying that in ancient times, you had a king. And when the king was present, you showed respect, you showed reverence, you showed even a measure of awe, you bowed to the king. We just don't have that in, in our modern society, that, that's all. Now, as an ancient concept, it was first realized in humanity from our very beginning. Adam was created with this sense of the fear of the Lord. It flowed from him knowing that he was, in fact, a creature who lived on a land brought forth by the living God, who, in fact, had created him from the very dust of that land and gave him commands concerning how he was to live in that land. Tragically, for Adam, he made the decision to trade in the healthy, fruitful, necessary, godly fear of the Lord, that deep reverence that would lead to him walking in God's ways. He decided to trade that in in his rebellion and his sin for another word that's translated fear or afraid in the Old Testament. Some of you will recall once Adam had sinned, he hid himself in the garden. And when the Lord called out to him, where are you? We all know it's not because the Lord was unmindful or unaware of where Adam was. It was so that Adam can begin to search himself. And then Adam said, I knew you were in the garden. And he said, I was afraid. That word is not the word of one who has deep reverence and respect. It is one who is in stark terror for his very life. Abraham, demonstrated this sense of fear during an encounter with the living God recorded in the beginning of Genesis 18. Genesis 18, and I didn't plan to read it, but I want to. It, it is a passage, I have to say, that I go back to from time to time to remind myself of the blessing and privilege it is to know and serve the living God. In this particular passage, the Lord appears to Abraham, and then Abraham, upon realizing it, and as soon as he notices that it is the Lord, he begins to act and put himself in a position as an eager servant. And let me point this out to you about how this happened. If you would turn, if, if you will, if not, that, that's all right. Genesis 18, I'm going to read from verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the yokes of Manre. 
as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly to the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. I hope you noticed the contrast and how Abraham, in the way that he worshiped the Lord, showed his very, very deep reverence and respect for God. Abraham at that time was a man of high standing in his region. He was a wealthy man, a man who was known to be respected. Note how when the Lord shows up, this man who was known to be respected, this man himself who had hundreds of servants and hired men, he ran. When you understand the culture of the Mideast that's endured for thousands of years, even today, running is not a sign necessarily of dignity. It is something that a servant would have to do. He took his whole house and brought them to a sense of urgency. It's as if Abraham was making sure that whatever was going on that day, it all stopped because the Lord had passed by and now they had an opportunity to serve him. Note how he asked for the privilege of serving the Lord before he asks. And note finally, and I can't get into this whole passage, the very position that he takes, it is the position that a servant would have taken upon waiting on his master, Abraham, the man of God, the man of standing, the heir of the promise, stood while the Lord ate the food that he had given him. Abraham had this deep, profound reverence and respect for the living God. This same reverence shows up in Abraham's great grandson. I'm not gonna get a chance to read that passage, but it's familiar to many of us. Joseph, the son of Jacob. Jacob, of course, was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery. And having sold him into slavery, Joseph, by the grace of God, was purchased by one of Pharaoh's high officials and began to work in Pharaoh's house. By God's favor and Joseph's own diligent in fear of the Lord, he began to rise in rank in that house to he, until he became basically the second in command of this man's entire household. However, as the old American Express card says, membership hath its privileges and perhaps its pitfalls. Not only did he catch the attention of the man of the house who recognized his gifts and his zeal and his diligence and that God was with him. Unfortunately, Joseph also caught the eye of his wife who constantly pressured Joseph to commit adultery 
day after day and day after day, he would say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Finally, many of you are familiar with the story. They are home alone. And once again, she begs him to commit adultery. Joseph at one point says, I'm, I cannot do this and sin against God and disrespect this man who has put me in this position. He runs out the house. She then lays a false charge on him and he has to endure not only the loss of his career, his position, his standing, but prison. But it's clear in the way Joseph would answer that he did so out of a fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord somehow that he had nurtured and carried, even though he was far away from his family, even though he had no idea if he would ever see his family again. Somehow, in some way, still, even as a young man, he had such a deep respect and reverence for the living God and his ways and his being and his will that he would not give in to the temptation to sin, even though it was an easy temptation to give in to. This concept of a God-given fear of the Lord has been present in humanity since our creation. It was codified by the living God once he inscripturated his word in passages such as Deuteronomy 12 that we read this morning in Proverbs 1. The fear of the Lord is one of those basic biblical concepts that strongly contributes to our view of the living God along with a proper and healthy motivation for our obedience to him. Consequently, when Solomon wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge some 500 years after Moses had written it in the books of the law, every Hebrew young person would have known exactly what he meant. And I believe every Hebrew young person, and I believe every young person today, and even those of us who wouldn't be classified as young, would have the idea of what it means now to have a deep, profound respect and reverence of the living God such that it strongly contributes to the way that we order our lives. And so we must always ask the question, do we have a fear of the Lord? With that in mind, how does the fear of the Lord factor into the art of skillful living? I have two main points. I'll deal with one this morning and one next week, our Lord willing. The fear of the Lord serve as serves as both the anchor and rudder for our lives. The fear of the Lord serves as both the anchor and rudder for our lives. And secondly, the fear of the Lord moves us to prize highly and thus walk worthy of the work of Christ in our lives. So first of all, our fear of the Lord serves as both the anchor and rudder for our lives. For that, I'd like to go to Deuteronomy 12, I mean, excuse me, Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 12 through 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? All of us, or most all of us, will know that an anchor is that object of a ship used to keep them from drifting away. You know, when ships in the past, perhaps even today, as they go into the harbor and they're moored in the harbor, they have to weigh anchor, drop their anchor, because if not, the tides will begin to cause them to drift away. I think you might know where we're going with this. It's our fear of the Lord that is our deep, 
profound respect and reverence for his being, his word, his ways, his salvation that can and will keep us from drifting into the unwise, ungodly, unfruitful ways of our own regular human nature, the world around us, and our enemy, Satan. In a similar way, just as the rudder directs, steers, and guides the path of a ship, so the fear of the living God guides, steers, and directs us into his ways of wisdom so that we might constantly and consistently practice the art of skillful living for the glory of God and our own good. We, we really should not miss that, dear ones. When Moses said that to the people of Israel as they were about to go into the promised land, Remember what I said, but well, maybe you don't remember what I said. That's all right. When, when I first preached um, Proverbs, the very first um, sermon, I said that Proverbs looks at the law of God in terms of what is the ways of wisdom of God and views the law of God, not simply as a list of rules, but as an entire culture. And so the issue is, what is the culture that we want to embrace in our own lives, in the lives of our family, in the lives of our church? And we embrace this culture because it is for our own well-being and it is for our own good. The very best way to get the most out of our lives is to live them according to the wisdom of the word of God. So then, in what ways can we begin to do this? And so, if I can say it this way, begin to feed our fear of God. Again, I think Deuteronomy 12, 10, 12 through 13 is a helpful guide. It can begin with us becoming familiar with his ways, coupled with a desire to walk in them. No. Scripture says, now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways? God's ways are his methods and manner with which he conducts his affairs and relates to creation. Those ways are inscripturated for us in the word of God, and they are the wise ways that we ought to live in relation to God and those around us. It's the ways that we've been exploring in the series thus far. And it is our fear of God that is our deep reverence of the living God that will move us to order our lives, that is to walk in those ways. That we will order our lives by the grace of God around God's methods and manners concerning our conduct with him and each other. That we will order our lives around the ways of God with respect to how we deal and grapple with temptation that we will order our lives around the ways of God with respect to how we speak to one another and how we speak in general, that we will order our lives around the ways and the methods of the living God concerning our care for the poor and the vulnerable, that we will do so in our attitude with which we approach our work. It will be our fear of the Lord, dear ones, that will guide our conduct in these areas. And again, we have to ask the questions, are we walking in the ways of the living God? Or are we walking in our own ways, believing that the culture around us may have the best answers for the art of skillful living? We move on from walking in the ways of the Lord, to developing this love for the Lord. You, you see this in the passage, to love the Lord. The word as used here carries with it a basic meaning of having a strong emotional attachment to the Lord, coupled with a desire to know him, to be in his presence, to be shaped by him, to become like him. As used here and as used throughout Scripture when it speaks, especially in the Old Testament, about our love for the Lord, 
It means that our chief desire for a life of complete satisfaction is with a worshiping relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. To put it another way, of all that is in this world that is so easily at our fingertips that we think might, would, might satisfy the deepest longings of our souls, to love the Lord says that he is the one that our heart truly wants, that he is the one that we truly crave, that in pouring our love into him, it expresses our belief that he is the one who indeed will satisfy the longings of our souls. We move there to a willingness to serve the Lord. Now, we looked at this word last week because it's the same word translated work in Genesis 2 and Exodus 20. We sort of talked about that a little bit last week, that this word work and service sometimes is used even interchangeably. The emphasis is on the service that we give to the living God right now through our act of worship, along with the free and joyful giving of our time, energy, and resources for the promotion of his kingdom and gospel. Added to that, our desire to serve the Lord in the obedience of our lives to his word. We do so with all of our heart and soul. That is, we do so putting all that we have in it, doing it with enthusiasm, as an end in and of itself, simply because we have been called and privileged to do so. Again, I think one of the best pictures of the attitude with which one, with which I know I want to carry in service to the Lord is Abraham in Genesis 18, that the Lord, and I love how the text reads, since you have passed by your servant, do not just pass him by, but stay and visit in the Lord, in the person of Jesus Christ came. And if I can use this language, he passed by us. He visited us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus who served the Father. We'll get into that next week. But it is Jesus who now has given us this great privilege of knowing, serving, loving the Lord God as an end in and of itself, because that's why we were created. And that's where we will find our lasting satisfaction. Lastly, and we'll close here and pick up this passage and, and this message next week, our Lord willing. By the grace of God, we carefully watch over and guard God's commands so that we diligently align our lives to them in every situation of our lives. That word in Deuteronomy is called keep means to watch over diligently. It is spoken of how a guard might watch over a prisoner or a treasurer might watch over a treasure to guard the commands of God for us mean that not only do we read them, but we begin to think through them. We begin through the power of the Spirit to pray that God would more and more impact them upon our hearts. We guard them in that when temptation begins to arise, we ask that through the power of God, that he will be our provision and our protection in such a way that the word of God will arise within us and it will begin to guard us from the temptations that are all so easily around us and those so easily to dive into. Though these words were written to young people a couple of thousand years ago, I, I want to end here by specifically speaking to our young people, our dear treasure, who in so many ways, you are our joy. And we're so thankful for you and the lives that God has given you and the young people you have become. And we would pray as a congregation and as your parents, even this week, that as we go back over Deuteronomy chapter 10, 
that we will begin to pray that these things would be true of you and all of us. That together we would have a group of people who are carefully watching over and guarding the word of God, carefully watching over and guarding this godly culture that we've been given that gives us life through Jesus Christ for our own good. So that when people around us, because if you're like me, you already made some foolish choices. You've done some foolish things. Things that perhaps you don't want to talk about. Things that perhaps you think the Lord would not want to have much to do with me. But when we come to the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and we know that he is the wise one who lived in the fear of the Lord all of his life, and that he forgives those like me who've made foolish choices, but not only forgives and as a substitute for my sin, but gives new life so that I can walk away from that sin. That when they see the life that is within us now, not lived in our own strength, but lived by the power of the spirit, according to the wisdom of God's word. And they wonder how is one so young conducting himself or conducting herself with such wisdom of life. We can point back to the one who created us in his image, put within us a deep reverence and respect for him as our creator. And then we can couple that with the, with the knowledge that when we rebelled against that and deserved the punishment and the judgment of a fool, Jesus Christ stepped in, took that punishment for us. And now we gladly live and walk in his ways for his glory and for the best life we could possibly have in him. Father, we wish we could do more justice to this concept in this passage. Our prayer is that this week we would read through our call to worship from Psalm 34, this passage from Proverbs 1, the passage from Deuteronomy 10, that beautiful passage that speaks of you being our praise and our life. And that as we read through them, that we will begin to pray that these things will be more and more true of us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, please remain seated for a few minutes. We're going to have uh, some music played as we see the main points of this. And you can just think through and reflect upon them. And then the praise team will lead us once more in a song of worship before we go into our time of our Lord's Supper. <laughs> Thank you. 